Okay, um, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming tonight. And I'm sure more will join uh, due to traffic. And we have, we also welcome our viewers online uh, as they're tuning in to tonight's event. Um, so in 1901, Israel Zangwill, a British Zionist, wrote in the liberal in the new liberal review that Palestine is a country without a people. As we commemorate the 75th anniversary of the Nakba this month, it is crucial to remember that the Nakba did not begin in 1948. It traces back to the moment European colonial powers and their Zionist allies set their sights on Palestine. These powers considered Palestine an empty land, not in the physical sense, as their travelers, settlers, adventurers, pilgrims, missionaries, colonists, artists, and others visited Palestine throughout the 19th and early 20th century. They walked its streets, mingled with its population, used its postal services, traveled on its trains, ate its food, drank its water. They knew that Palestine had people. However, in their view, these people, the Palestinians, did not constitute a nation in the modern sense, nor did they believe Palestinians had roots in Palestine. This perception of an empty land, a land without a people, underlies the ideology that would later justify the Nakba. Yet, we Palestinians as a people, as a nation, as individuals, as communities, we know our country, we love our country, and we honor our homeland. It is where we have lived, continue to live, and will remain as living communities, families, and custodians of a and custodians of a precious heritage and culture that has been passed down over centuries. As historian Nur Masalha articulated in his book, Palestine, a 4,000 year history, Palestinians have always perceived Palestine as their country, even before the rise of modern nationalism. Today, as we mark the 75th anniversary of the Nakba, we pay tribute to the thousands of Palestinians who lost their lives, homes, and livelihood due to this ongoing journey of suffering and estrangement. The Nakba represents a continuous process of uprooting, erasure, and destruction. Amid Israeli threats of a second Nakba, we acknowledge the existential threats faced by our people in Palestine. Yet, it is, our, it is also essential to take pride in our resilience and defiance, and to celebrate our existence and our capacity to resist and survive against considerable odds, even after 75 years of disposition, denial of rights, and, and constant aggression. It is my honor today to welcome to the Palestine Center and the Jerusalem Fund two amazing guests who embody the spirit of resilience and the yearning of ret for return. Their journey as part of a beautiful family and their accomplishments illustrate how Palestinians have defied the impossible to thrive and preserve their roots and memories while inspiring us to continue, to, to continue fighting to end the Nakba and secure our sacred rights, notably the right of return. So our star for tonight, Dr. Abdel Ghaffar Musa was born in Abbasiyya, Palestine in 1939. Along with his family, he was expelled from his village under gunfire during Al-Nakba in 1948 and was raised in al nawaymi refugee camp. He received an honorable scholarship to the American University of Beirut and completed his university and medical training there. He then worked at the Arabian American oil company, Aramco, for five years before moving to the United States, where he completed his training um, as a physician. And he treated cancer patients for 37 years in Syracuse, New York, where he was also chairman um, uh, of obstetrics and gynecology at the St. Joseph's Hospital. He now lives in Great Falls, Virginia, with his beautiful wife, Sultana Musa, and enjoys spending time with his three children and five grandchildren. We're also honored to welcome Jumana Musa, who is a dedicated human rights attorney, racial justice activist, and proud Palestinian with a personal connection to the Nakba. 
Currently, she holds the position of Director of the Fourth Amendment Center at the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, NACDL, where she leads the organization's efforts to establish a new legal framework for the Fourth Amendment in the digital era. In her previous role, she served as the organization's Senior Privacy and National Security Council, worked as policy consultant for the Southern Border Communities Coalition, addressing issues related to militarization and brutality by U.S. Customs and Border Protection agents, and served as deputy director for the Rights Working Group, coordinating campaigns against racial profiling. She also held the position of Advocacy Director for Domestic Human Rights and International Justice at Amnesty International USA, where she focused on the human rights impact of U.S. counterterrorism efforts, including her role as a legal observer at Guantanamo Bay Military Commission proceedings. So without further ado, join me in welcoming Dr. Abdul Ghaffar Musa and Jumana Musa. Thank you. Thank you. So there is... Are these just for the camera, or do they amplify us here too? Is it for the camera and for our uh, online uh, viewers? Also. Wonderful. All right. So I, I think oftentimes we start these conversations and we talk about you know death and destruction and occupation and resistance, um, which is all part of the Palestinian story. But there is also uh, hope and resilience and joy and culture and humanity. And so tonight we're going to talk about both of those things because you can't have one without the other. And you know the latter is very much um, what's responsible for the survival of the Palestinian people. Because anywhere we go, we find community, we make joy, we eat well, um, and we make children <laughs> who do some silly things. Um, so I'm, I'm very, I'm actually thrilled to be able to have this conversation with my dad today. I've heard some stories, but I've realized as we've been doing this a little bit, I, there are stories that I still haven't heard. Um, so I thought we could start with just talking about Abbasi, which wasn't originally called Abbasi, and you know what it was like to be a kid there. If I'm not wrong, your grandfather was the Mukhtar, which is like the mayor. And my father. Your father too. And so, and so you were very much part of the fabric of Abbasi, the everyday life of Abbasi. Probably everybody knew Hassan and Musa, Hassan and Musa. So tell us a little bit about life in Abbasi. Okay. <clears throat> Well, I was born in 1939, and Abbasi at that time was, uh, which is to make things, it's close to Jaffa, which is about six kilometers from Jaffa, and a lot of people used to uh, walk to Jaffa, and uh, in that time, when I started, you know, conceiving of things, there was a bus in, in Abbasi also, which goes, which I remember the name Bas Musa Hassan, and the <laughs> name was, and it was 10 piastres to go from Abbasi to Yapa. So Abbasi was the second largest village in Palestine. And in 48, the census was 5,500 inhabitants of Abbasi. It's second to Fallujah, which is Fallujah of, you know, between Gaza and Hebron. It was 6,000. In Abbasi, it was really, uh, which I heard the gentleman there talking about people without land for the land without people. It was full of orange groves. It's green everywhere you go olive trees, farming lands. I didn't see anything not farmed or green when I was growing up there. And also they used to be like the center. It's not like um, farmer's market here, but there is the soup, which is the market on Friday where they come from all around the villages and the towns in the area. And it's really busy that the, every Friday in Abbasi, where people trade and buy and do things. The, uh, the school which I went to, still to me, is one of the most beautiful schools and gardens and flowers and roses and everything. <clears throat> and, it, and it was till seventh grade at that time when I joined. 
And <laughs> once they finish, they go to, when they graduate from seventh grade, they go to Jaffa, which is called the Al-Amari or Rashidi, uh, sorry, to uh, Ramli, which I don't remember the name of where my brother went to Ramli, also when he finished that year. So people were living nicely and it has five Hamudi, which is a tribe. It's not like here in Maya, the city and so on. And each chief of that Hamudi will manage all the, for the, their group, the government things, the government positions, signatures and so on. And my grandfather was the Mukhtar and my father followed that. And it's all by election, not by all uh, there was elections. And the last election was my uncle, who was my wife's father. And we went for his election all over the city, but unfortunately, he didn't make it. Somebody, so somebody else made it. So originally, we are descendant, our sixth grandfather descended from a town in uh, next to uh, Hebron, which I visited by chance in 1950 when I was a fourth grade. It's called <coughs> Beit uh, Ben Naim, and it's still there. And our Hamuli, which is the tribe, still they have the same name because I met one of the kids from that uh, in college and the Hamuli Tahmidat is still there. And just to make sure things remember, and this is for the future, there were five tribes, Manasra, Dalajshi, and so on. So once, about five years ago, we went to Irvine and we had a meeting there and we for <clears throat> donations and fundraising for the Palestinians. So we came out with 10 scholarships to different colleges and some money. And that's what I want to say is at the end, when I spoke and two young, beautiful women came to me in their early 20s and they said, we are from Abbasia and we are from Hamule the Dalalshi. You remember that? And what Hamule are you from back there? So this is to show you the continuation of the feeling of belonging to the place. And that was very, very, really moving to me when I heard this. Thank you. So <laughs> you're welcome. So, you know, when it comes to the feeling of belonging and the continuity, I know um, Tina and I went with mom the first time she went back to Abbasi since 48. And I remember two things very distinctly. The first one I'll never forget was mom standing sort of in the middle of everything, trying to locate herself and think about where was their house? And the other thing I remember is that where the market was, there's now a strip mall. Yes. <laughs> and so, um, you know, it's they, they sort of papered over, but didn't really change. Um, so that sounds like it was a lovely place to grow up, but you didn't get to stay. And so, <laughs> you know, gunfire and, and, uh, Gunfire will do that to a family. I think everybody um, who knows anything about Palestine knows that with massacre is like a dear Yassin. We're very much a warning to everybody when they enter at a village and massacred every man, woman, and child that they found to let people know that when we come, you should leave. And if you don't leave, this is what awaits you. And I think that was um, behind a lot of what motivated families to go. Nobody thought it was forever, but that was... Uh, ever present in people's minds. And so talk to us about what it was like at the time that came to your village and you were forced out. Well, usually we used to have, um, hear about 
you know, firing here and there around the village, but not very <coughs> consistent and very <coughs> big thing. <coughs> and as kids, we used to run when it is fighting and there is some to get the empty bullets and collect them. So we play with them and we get a wire guns and we put the bullets and shoot with them. That was our games uh, from that. But the first thing which really that shook the village or the town, it was in, a, in one day around noon or a little bit in the afternoon and we were in classes in the school. I was third grader at that time. And they came, there was a settlement called Nabis. I don't know what happened to it. And yesterday next to Tel Aviv, they came from Nabis from the north. It was north of our town. And they came through the main street to that center of the town where my mother's cousin had a big cafe in the center of town, which was like the meeting of a lot of people. And they came in with jeeps and automatic weapons and they shot and killed everybody they saw in that street coming into the city. And I don't know why the school administration, they released us. They released us from school that happened. The school was on the east side of our town. And when 1936, when my grandfather died and the brothers got separated into families, my uncle and his brothers, they took the main house in the center of town. And my father and my other uncle, they went and built houses outside town on the west side. So I had to cross from east to west through it. And there, <clears throat> with everybody was really scared. One of my relatives saw me, she grabbed me and put me under their stairs because they have a, a house, two story house at that time. Then they said, they are coming here. So they grabbed me and her son, that's my experience. To go, they have a very small, tiny house way in the center town. There are no streets, just alleys between the houses. On the way there, we met my mother. And my mother was worried about my bro older brother who used to be a customer of that cafe a lot. So they went to look whether he was hurt or not. Then she found out he was not. And we saw her, she got me and we went home. That was my first experience with real fighting and war. So I know you were talking about, um, you know, who kept the house in the middle of town and you built houses a little bit on the west side. Um, you were the youngest. You were the youngest in your family. Yes. And uh, number eight. Number eight. Well, there are two who died, so really number 10. And so, and your dad was concerned that maybe your this brother. This is from two wives, number yes. eight, because there are two. Okay, important from to know. The other wife. If I tell you the story of the other wife. Yeah, we're going to leave that story it's today. Very funny, but we're not going to talk about it. Different story for a different day. Um, it's a different story for a different day. Yeah. But your dad was concerned that your brother wouldn't share with you one day. And so he put some land in your name, right? Oh, yes. Because I was the youngest, Mom. and my brothers, Mom. two brothers, maybe, <clears throat> and her children were older than me also. He was afraid if something happens to him, that they will not give me anything. Because he owns, they have an you know, orange grove, they have olive trees, farming lands, tractor, caterpillars, tractors, and a lot of things around. So what he did, he used to buy land and write it under my name because he can give his kids anything he wants when he is alive. That's in our culture and our religion. If he dies, he cannot do that or he cannot. There is no will to write. You have to go by. So he wrote, and to make the long story short, I had land still, maybe I have it or not, 
and the runways of Ben Gurion Airport, which is next to our hometown. Yeah, so my story is that I own part of and an airport. When, when I went in 214, and the only place in the town was standing is the mosque, mm -hmm. which is on the highway between Jaffa and Ramli and Lit. So when I stood there, the runways are south of that highway. And it really hurt me to look at them. And I own part of that in my mind. Thank you. So let's talk about the day that you were forced out. The last day that you lived in your village. Okay. And you were forced out. The fighting continues. And a lot of people started dying. And they come and attack and go. So they're really... It's getting this, I think it was March or April, I think, of 48. So my dad came to me as the youngest. He said, let's go. I want to take you with me and we leave today. Because if they kill everybody, that is vision. You will survive. You will get the family name and you get things back to fight not because he wants me to leave. He wants me to be prepared to come back and fight. So we went, he and myself, and there was some bullets going through the corn fields and the wheat fields. We went to walking to a village called Der Tarif. He has a friend there and <clears throat> we spent the night and I was watching at their uh, fence people started to coming because really it's getting worse. And people are coming on donkeys, on carts, on walking and, you know. So the next day, my brother came to look for us and he found us and he has a mule with a wooden cart on it. He took us to Thiri. We found already my uncle's family and my wife included, they are in theory school, already left, and they went to theory school. So we stayed there for a while, and then because it's coming, it's getting worse. So we started walking up the mountains. We crossed the road and walking the mountains, and luckily enough, we had a caterpillar tractor at that time that was coming. They want to get out. And we got in the trolley of the tractor and then we moved. We kept going and we went to the Rantis and Abud and the Arab Mishal and all these. And I remember my father he used to go and ask them if they had a place for us to live with a big family. At last, we found a place in a, a village called Derendam or Asluch, which is next to Nabi Saleh. So this is where we spent the first night. And the real tragedy that night was when they go up the, mount the mountain and there is a big slope, somebody detached the trolley from the caterpillar without putting support behind it. So it slipped all the way down and it got in a big hole and the only one who was on that <clears throat> trolley was my mother. And he pushed her up and landed on a rock on her sternum, which is the front of the chest, broke the bones. And that town, even we couldn't find a, <clears throat> a baby aspirin, not only aspirin, for pain. So she spent all the night awake, yawning and moaning and her little son crying next to her. That was my second night when I left. So after you left, you didn't have school. You didn't have a school to go to for a little while. Well, there were no schools. When yeah. we left in 48, as I said, all the schools are inhabited by people. Mm -hmm. Even the shrines like my... Uh, my uh, uncle's family, they were in Rantis and they came to Nabi Saleh with the shrine of Nabi Saleh there. They lived there. And I'm sure Sharif will remember that. Huh? 
<laughs> he was so, only one years old. So there was no school. And what we did, net the rest of 48 and 49, if I tell you what we, what I, we did with my cousin, who is my age, unfortunately, he passed away in April last month. <clears throat> we went to school together. We had two mules and a donkey. So we go and get the uh, two mules to feed them grass and all that most of the day. And the rest of the day we go down because the spring was down in the valley of that mountain. So they gave us two of these uh, army gallons. They put them on the donkey and we take it down, fill it with, the, with water and bring it. We make like six, seven trips every day, either me or my cousin. This is what we did. And sometimes we can escape and go visit Petrina or Dera uh, Sani, whatever, and things around. Then in 1950, this is where things changed. They started the United Nations Working Agency for Palestinian Refugees or UNRWA. They started camps, refugee camps, because there was no refugee camps before. I mean, I used to look in that there in Dam. You go to the olive trees, they have either uh, a piece of cloth or whatever it is, or they're around that tree, and this is their home. They eat, they cook, they bathe, they do everything. No cave I saw in the area when we were kids, except inhabited by people. So when they had the camps and they opened the schools, my dad jumped immediately because you wanted me to go back to school. So they assigned us to a refugee camp north of uh, Jericho, where we started the school immediately in a tent. And what, it's not like this, it's uh, made of uh, uh, hay, you know, hasiri we call it. We sit on the hasiri. And the only thing the teacher at the beginning, he had the rock to sit on, but now they got him a chair and they are only one blackboard and a chalk, that's it. And some of the tents are really long. They accommodate two classes. And the, a lot of the kids, when it rains, mm -hmm. all these hasiri will be soaked. So there is no school. <laughs> or it's a little bit of wind, then they, Tent is gone, so there is no school. <laughs> so this is how we finished. I did uh, third grade, finished it, fourth grade, fifth grade. All right, so we're going to talk about this a little bit. So okay. you got to go back to school. Thank you. I know both you and mom were very good students. No pressure on us. Very good students. Um, I also remember, I don't know if you remember this, mom, but when I was, as after I was out of law school, you called me one day, you said, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm going to Baltimore. We're protesting NSEERS. And your statement to me was, we didn't spend all this money, so you stay shouting in the street. It was a quote. I never forgot it. But, but, still am. But <laughs> it didn't start with me. I understand when dad was a high school student, he led a lot of walkouts from school. So I like to think I inherited it. But why don't you talk to us a little bit about that? What were you What were you guys walking out of class for? What were you organizing around? Oh yeah, we're talking uh, okay. about okay. Yeah. Then I moved on sixth grade. I moved from the Anwar School to the government school in Jericho, mm -hmm. and I have two of my uh, alma mater here. They have went <laughs> Hisham Ibn Abdul Malik School, <laughs> same school, and I started till. Uh, only I left one year to go to Hussein's college in Amman, but I didn't find it. I thought it's different, but I found it no. So I went back to Hisham and I graduated from there. But because of what happening, there were a lot of commotions in the country, a lot of 
you know, what we were talking about, a lot of parties, political parties, different ones. And we used to have a lot of demonstrations and they get you in jail sometimes. But what we, whenever we see something, I was one of the really moving guys. We go from refugee camp in Nuemi, go to something called Aina Sultan, which is the Sultan's eye, and if you want to translate it. Then Aba Jabr, which was the largest Palestinian refugee camp. There were 50,000 people in Aba Jabr. So we got all the schools and come to Jericho and close the school in Jericho and just demonstrate against what's going on. We were very, very active in these things. And I remember one day we were, we moved. Before I went to school, we started from Nuwami and we went to Aina Sultan. Then the police came and said, why don't you make them in line? I said, okay, the group who was in charge, we made them in line. Then what we found out, they want to arrest us, the ones on the head of the line. So we ran away <laughs> and they followed us with their horses, but they couldn't get us. Yeah. Believe me, they couldn't get us. So these are the things which we live. Even when I went one in 1956 to uh, Hussein's college, which is the largest nail school in Amman. And there was the Baghdad Pact, Halif Baghdad, which was very, very strong at that time. So we closed all the schools in Amman. We closed, we used to have uh, go as a group from different schools, go to Ragadan Palace, which is the <clears throat> place of King Hussein at that time. And uh, as a matter of fact, we destroyed all his gardens. We <laughs> pulled out all the, the flowers and he used to come and talk to us. Mm -hmm. And it went on all year till Hale Baghdad disappeared. So what I will say about this is, uh, I guess in the words of what my husband would say is I come by it honest. I guess what we would say is Dal Ala Buha, right? <laughs> um, so after high school though, you got a UN scholarship. You got a UN scholarship. You went to college and medical school in Lebanon. Okay. And uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time on Lebanon, though. Huh? We're not going to spend a lot of time in Lebanon. I okay. do know that. Well, when I finished uh, high school, I just want to say something about uh, my experience with, uh, which got me more attached to this. Because Jericho is the lowest part on earth below sea level. 372 meters below sea level. It's hot, but it's not humid like here. It's really dry heat. So we wanted to study for our high school exam, which is there to go to college, you need the high school exam, okay? It's not only your grades from your school like here. So uh, I was there, which is, I tried to convince the principal of the school who was from Hebron at that time, he would not fight. So I took the whole class, we were 50 in the class, and we went to Qa'im Makam, which is the county executive right now. That's Qa'im Makam, the county executive. He was out of the school. When he came back to school, they told him, Musa took them to the Khan Makam. So he came there. Then he convinced us to go back to school. And he put us, you know, in a row of two. Then we went through, because it was outside the city. So we went through the city. We did not want to show that he is controlling us. We made the circle. Anyhow, we went there and he said, why don't you go, there is a park for the government, go there. I said, no, it's hot, still. <clears throat> so he decided, okay, you leave. So he gave us six weeks to go and study in uh, <clears throat> anywhere you want. So my dad immediately got me a room with a family in a town called Aizri, which is next to Abu Dis, Mr. Agrikat's hometown. So I really spent six weeks studying between 
the olive trees of Abu Dis or Al-Aqsa Mosque. Take the bus from Azaragi one 10 cents and go to uh, spend the whole day in Al-Aqsa and the Dome of the Rock inside or outside. It's just beautiful. Then we sat for the high school exam in a church at the old uh, wall of Jerusalem, which we saw all the Jewish ladies from because it was on the third floor of the hallway. So this is, gives me really more and more attachment to the areas which I saw when I was young. Okay, so I am looking at the time. So we do, we have to fast forward. You went to Lebanon. I said, we have to fast forward. We have to keep moving because we, we're going to get short on time. Okay. So you got an Enroa scholarship. You went to college. You went to medical school in Beirut. Um, also led some students in protest. And then you went to Aramco for five years where you were working, sending money home. Uh, you had my brother. You married mom. Um, you talked about the attachment you developed. You were already now not just displaced from your village, but displaced from your country, right? You were in Beirut. Now you're in Saudi Arabia. What brought you to the decision to come to the United States? Okay. Well, I went to the American University of Beirut, which is chartered by the state of New York. That's on my degrees, chartered by the state of New York whether it's Savama Diploma, the BSc, the MD, and everything. And they followed the system in the hospital we had, which was accredited by the Joint Commission in the United States, like any hospital in the United States. So when I did all what I did to help my family to go to Aramco and graduate my nephews from medical schools, two, me two medical schools, one pharmacy and one business. Then I have to do my training. I have to specialize. And the only place I go is to the United States. So I applied. I wrote a letter to the first place, which I didn't write any letter anywhere else. And two of my classmates were in that department at Upstate Medical Center in Syracuse, New York, which is part of the State University of New York, SUNY. SUNY has four medical schools, not one. So they gave me, uh, they sent me uh, an acceptance immediately. I didn't have to apply anywhere else. That's why I came to the United States. So you came here to get training. Um, I don't know if you knew this, but actually in Syracuse, not only was there an Arab community, but the biggest portion of the Arab community in Syracuse was Palestinian, which is unusual for the U.S. And I remember I had a, uh, there was a magazine. It was in the Sunday like newspaper, the parade magazine. They lit they had a spread on the Palestinians of Syracuse. And so it's, it's, you know, just part of the way in which we continue to build community everywhere we go. Um, you got your training, you specialized, you became an oncologist. You had me, which is a great accomplishment. <laughs> you also had, had Tina. So you, you guys have definitely gotten settled here. But I do know growing up, um, it was very clear we weren't like the other kids. Um, where our house was, one, the first house they bought, there was a road called Woodchuck Hill Road. And our neighborhood looped off of that road. And what I didn't know when I was little is on the other side of that road, there was a shooting range. And so when I was little, and these are the things I know my friends, you know, at school did not think about, I heard shooting and it was far away. So in my head, I was listening to the war in Lebanon because it was shooting and it was far away. I had no idea we had a shooting range across, you know, across the street from our neighborhood. Um, but I also remember mom who told me she didn't raise me to stay shouting in the streets. When I was eight years old, you took me downtown. Me and my cousin Reem. We were told, you know, these are your only cousins in America. It was true at the time. Um, and we went downtown. We were protesting for Palestine. And you get it, it's not up here anymore. You used to have the image of it, but Reem and I were walking around with a sign that was like a postcard and it said to Palestine. And there was a stamp on it that said, return to sender, no such address. Yeah. 
It was an iconic one. We ended up on the evening news actually with that. And so, you know, we're at a place where you've now gone very far away from both home and family. And at the time we didn't have a lot of family here. We had our cousins. You had one brother in Canada and that was all of us that were here and one cousin and that was it. And so it was the start of a very different kind of life. And so in that context, how is it that you thought about, like, I mean, I still remember, you know, going to St. Elias Church and the Debke Troop would come and the different Palestine events that would happen. Um, how is it, is it something that you thought about deliberately or is it just a function of how we live in terms of the type of sense of identity that you instilled in your kids? I didn't get the last. The sense of identity that we all had. Like if you ask any one of us, Demi Falastini, right? Like there's, there's, there was never, it took me a long time. I was well into college or maybe past college before I thought of myself as a hyphenated American. I wasn't a hyphenated anything. We were Palestinian from just, that's it. There was no other piece of it. Well, this is very, uh, very good. Uh, when I came, I didn't know much about the United States. All I know from my professors at the university. So to tell you, we arrived the next day, I found out they rent a townhouse for us before we came and I thought it was furnished, but it was not. So I went to an Italian furniture store the next day on North Salina Street, which is the main street of Syracuse. And I went there and I told the guy, I want the cheapest furniture you have. He looked at me and he said, what? I said, listen, I just came to the United States yesterday mm -hmm. and to Syracuse. Whether I will like Syracuse or not, or I like to live in the United States or not, I want a furniture as cheap as we can. So he did, and we got to furnish all that townhouse, believe it or not, a room for our son, a room for us, dine it, and all that for nine hundred fifty dollars at that time nineteen seventy one yes, and it saved us five years till I finished my fellowship, and I gave it to our Joanne oncology floor in the hospital, the secretary she was a black woman and a little bit poor. So I gave her all the furniture before we go back to Syracuse. And always, always, I felt I have the roots. I have to go. And uh, I tried to raise my kids, my associates, always to be one thing, that we lost something. We cannot lose identity. We have to keep our identity. And all what I did with that, because I went to Memphis, Tennessee for two years for fellowship, the same thing. We have to keep our identity all through. And I'm glad I did. And I think I succeeded. I think you did too. And I think about the fact that, you know, you're sitting and talking to people who, you know, went to the same schools and then you know, your daughter and their niece, and we all come together and find each other, um, you know, even all these miles away. And so, you know, I know you've quoted a lot where Golda Meir had tried to say, you know, the old will die and the young will forget. And never have I been so happy to prove somebody wrong. We'll never forget and we will return. And I've so enjoyed the opportunity to be able to have this conversation with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Musa. Thank you so much, Jumana. Um, now we'll open it for questions from our audiences, if uh, that's okay with you. And um, and then we'll conclude. So uh, if you have any questions, please raise your hand and I will bring the mic to you. Thank you, Jihad. Uh, and I really want to thank you and thank Muhammad and Ruqayya. You guys are doing an amazing job. Uh, all these events, and of course, I'm I'm truly honored every time I see you. I am honored uh, by seeing you, and now you know, listening to what uh, what you have shared with us, uh, it, it brings back a great deal of memories for me. I mean, you know, I have very similar 
experiences. We've been to the same places. We went to the same school. Um, you know, you've been, you studied at my village and so on. And uh, the same thing. I mean, you know, I remember in uh, our school, the first time we all got arrested, you know, half of the class was arrested. It was during the Algerian revolution because we, you know, we were uh, out there, we were kids, you know, demonstrating for Algeria. And they came, collected all of us, and they put us uh, in Maghfar, you know, the, the police station in, in Jericho. You also talk about uh, Nwame, which I really know. You talk about Akbar Jabba, which I really know. You talk about Abbasi, and I have so many friends from Abbasi. I mean, you know, still alive, some have died, and so on. So, uh, yeah, all these images and uh, that you sh you shared with us. I mean, you talked about Hel Baghdad. Uh, you know, my one of my brothers spent three years in prison for Hel Baghdad. You know, the same thing. He was my oldest brother, and so on. So this is really the Palestinian story. You know, it has always been an activist uh, and and doers and, uh, you know, pursuers of uh, uh, whatever goals uh, they have uh, and so on. I mean, you know, I remember seeing the kids um, always uh, going up and down Wad al for instance, you know, on the sides in Jericho studying, you know, and uh, some of them would work in al Hisbe, you know, which is the, you know, the, uh, like the, I guess, Eastern market here and so on. Yeah. The wholesale. Yeah, the wholesale market and so on, and they they would be studying, reading their books and so on, and, and so on. So this is really the Palestinian uh, tradition. I know, uh, but also what you, what you talked about in terms of erasure and, and all this thing. I mean, it was when they said that there is no, uh, it's a land without people. It's it is part of the plan to erase the people from the land. I mean, this goes back way back. I mean, you know, evangelical Zionism or uh, Christian Zionism goes back, I think, like a thousand years. It's not something new. You know, all these races that became uh, uh, prime ministers and so on, like Churchill and his and so on, were, you know, were rooted deeply uh, immersed and rooted in uh, Christian Zionism and all this thing. That's a different topic altogether. You know, all this, I, I want to ask you a, one question. I mean, you know, it's uh, Palestinians always, uh, that those who were forced to leave, I mean, we were not forced to leave. I mean, now we are all refugees because, uh, you know, I'm from the West Bank, from uh, from Abadis and Jericho and all and all this thing. Well, my question to you, if, you know, by whatever magic or power of magic, Al-Abbasiyah uh, was liberated tomorrow, what would be the first thing that you would do? When you return, thank you. When they had the the uh, when they give back to Gaza and the terrible, which now I call it terrible, but I didn't know much. I'm not a politician. The uh, Oslo Accord, which is another Nakba. Okay, I thought a great and Fred Schwartz, we used to have a group, dialogue group, Palestinians, Jewish friends, and others, non-Jewish, non-Palestinian. And we meet every month, it's called dialogue group. And Rich Schwartz was a prominent lawyer at Syracuse University. And we were in a party and he came I want to dance with you for the Palestinian state. This is what Rich was, God bless his soul, okay? We used to meet in our houses. So there is nothing that let you, which I tell you also one thing, which when I got my passport, American passport, I wanted to write, uh, you know, birthplace Palestine. And the guy said, no. There is no country for Palestine. I said, sir, there it was, there is, there will be, whether you like it or not. He said, well, that's beside the point. I said, no, I don't want your passport if you don't put Palestine. So they send me my passport with Palestine, their place, Palestine. When they send my wife's passport, Palmyra, New York, their place. I said, my wife never heard of Palmyra, New York. Well, how can she be born there? <laughs> so they went back and they changed it to birthplace Palestine for it. So that's the story. Still, Dami Palestini 
no matter where I go. Yeah, I just have two questions. Uh, yes. One, uh, the Palestinians are considered the most educated people in the world. I've read that. Uh, and considering all the obstacles, uh, do you have any clue? Could you give us any reason, you know, how that has come about? Uh, you know, what is in the Palestinian life to make them the most educated in the world? Uh, and the second thing is, uh, uh, you certainly uh, given a very inspiring story here. And I was wondering if the uh, story is, appears anywhere in print or in, if you, are you? Or if not, uh, is it a possibility that uh, you will publish something because it is an inspiring story that I think everyone should know about? Thank you. The first question is why Palestinians are for education all through. And as a matter of fact, I read somebody sent me some statistics about the American University of Beirut in the early century of 20th century. And the highest number of students at the American University of Beirut were Palestinians. And I want to tell you, when I graduated from American school, we graduated only 36 students. That's my class. Nine of us were Palestinians. We are second to the local the Lebanese people, the host of the university, the second to the Lebanese. So nine of us, the doctors were Palestinians. And wherever you go, you find Palestinians. So this is their education. And the only way is to get back on our feet is to fight is education, education and education. And I know Palestinians are educated all over. I meet them all over, I, I go. And the only thing is when they call the Palestinians who stayed in Israel, which there are now more than 350 Palestinians to cross that name, Palestine, they call them Israeli Arabs. They don't call them Israeli and Palestinians. I am here. I am American Palestinian or Palestinian American, okay? If he comes from Italy, Italian American. But there, they never mentioned Palestine. Even in Saispico, you read about it. Everywhere you read, they want to omit the name Palestine. But they will not be able to do that. So I will and also if say I tell that, you, yeah. if I tell you the story of my granddaughter, <laughs> who is fourth generation, she just finished first year law school. She wrote a paper about the economy of the Palestinians and the Israelis. Actually, specifically, because it was brilliant on the tax scheme that the Israelis imposed on Palestinians and why through that tax code, they have already shown that this is not a matter of two states by any stretch of the imagination that there is no autonomous government and it is a full occupation. Yeah. It was a very good paper. Yeah, so Jade mm -hmm. wrote that up and gave it to the professor. It seems the professor is, we love Jews, don't misunderstand me. I have tons of, Jewish friends, but she seems she's a Zionist, and she gave their F. Okay, Jade never got F in her class, so she was really crying that night. What happened? Then we worked it out. Then all they go to the chairman, go to other professors, and let them look at it. So what she did, she did look at it, and everybody said this is a great article and great paper. They send her back to that professor and she gave her A on that and paper. And that paper actually won the, the well, award I'm coming, I'm for coming. the political science department. Then I know, but we- The graduating <laughs> that, class, we go ahead. Yeah, no, that paper did actually win the award for the entire political science department, not just for any particular part yes. of it. $500 check. 
But I will say on the question of education too, I think it's important to remember that in the context of loss, of having an entire foreign population of people both occupying your lands and talking to international institutions about handing your land over to them, there was a strong sense that education was not only critical to that conversation, but once you obtained it, it could not be taken away. And so I remember when I went to college and I was like a flaky first year student taking classes and mom called me and she said, what are you going to major in? And I was like, I don't know, maybe sociology. Like, I don't, I took like two classes. I thought it was interesting. Huh? No, it was sociology. It was sociology. And I, and the reason I never forgot this, because mom's response was, well, you're going to get at least a PhD. And I started laughing. I said, at least a PhD? Like, how many degrees am I supposed to get? But I mean, that's that's very much, she was aiming and got us all very educated. So I think we have a question from Julie. Um, did you play any sports when you were in, when you were a kid? Unfortunately, no. Thank you. Yeah, I'm okay. We're up taking stacks, so I'll bring you the mic. We have a question here. Oh, okay, okay. Um, good evening. My name is Anton. I'm uh, I'm from Bethlehem, and you know about uh, the lost identity. And uh, when I first came to the US. Uh, 2010, I I, th I thought that there is something that can never be taken is the collective national identity. And uh, growing up in in Palestine, in Bethlehem, you know, that was, we demonstrated against everything that happens against I know all Arabs. I Bethlehem very well, don't worry. We right. them <laughs> but we demonstrate against everything and that's uh, considered um, against the collective Arab-Palestinian identity. Where, But now I feel that there is less and less of that um, um, energy that the motivation of uh, you know whatever hurts one hurts everyone else whatever uh, impact a certain uh, identity impacts the collective and from you from your perspective is that you know you close by saying you know the old dies and then the young um, forgets from that like what pieces of advice can you give for the for the old actually to inspire the young not to forget well that's the main issue here that every generation could prepare the next generation to carry the thing with them and go forward and this is the only way to survive and i believe how long in my life, I see the new generations are great and they are well educated, they are well aware of the situation. And as I told you, the two girls from Irvine, California, they came to tell me, Do you want more than that? I think I would add to that. I think what I see um, when I look at younger Palestinian folks in the diaspora is that they are not just focused on Palestine. They are drawing larger interconnected political movements, right? In the United States, they are understanding the nature of state violence and how it manifests here through the police and the Black Lives Matter movement and making those connections, even in the police officers that are training their officers with the Israeli military occupying force and then bringing them back here to occupy the neighborhoods of black and brown people. They're making connections like they did with the water protectors from the indigenous communities here. They're making connections around the world and I think have changed the nature of the conversation. So it's not a conversation, you know, this intractable uh, conflict between the Israelis and the Arabs as people tried to paint it, but really a, a conversation about what it is to be a First Nations people, what it is to be an indigenous community, what land back means in that context. And I think that by working through those larger political networks and drawing that solidarity across movements, uh, we're not only passing on identity, but we are really multiplying our impact in terms of talking about 
our people and our situation and making the connections with other people and their situations. Because once you draw it into the larger conversation, it makes it much more difficult to do what this country has always tried to do, which is to make it some exceptional thing that is different and not what you think. It's not like all these other things, it's very different. And it's a conversation that then gets dominated by, you know, Israeli security versus the human rights of the Palestinians that are impacted by the occupation every day. Thank you so much. We have a question. Yes, thank you. Hi, thank you very much for that. Uh, my name is Dina Fox. And um, you said, uh, almost the last thing that you said was, we will return. Uh, do you still believe that, number one? Number two, what do you think is the greatest obstacle to your returning? Thank you. Um, yes, the short answer is yes. Uh, I don't say things I don't believe. <laughs> and I don't say things for effect. Um, you know, I think th this is where I always go back to Nelson Mandela, who said it always seems impossible until it's done. And so the Berlin Wall didn't fall until it fell. And apartheid in South Africa wasn't over until it was over. It doesn't mean that then it ushers in a magical era of you know, human rights and joy for everybody. There's a lot of work to be done. But do I think it will happen? Yes. Um, I think that we are in a moment where fascism is on the rise everywhere, but that is also mobilizing people against fascism everywhere. And that's again, where we where people are able to start to draw those connections. Um, and I think that now the conversation is being had in a different way than it's ever been had. You know, what does that look like? Is a different conversation? You know, is it one secular state? Is it something else? I mean, I think there's a lot to be worked through, but do I believe that this current situation of dispossession, occupation, and common death is, is sustainable? It's not, it never has been. It doesn't mean it can't get worse, but historically it always has to fall. And then the question becomes what comes next? And so that's where I feel like your question about the younger generation, that's the important conversation to have right? It will stop. It will end. It will fall. But what do we have in place to ensure that what comes afterwards is something that gives people their dignity, their human rights, and the opportunity to just experience joy? Thank you so much for this beautiful answer. Thank you. Do we have any questions? If not, um, again, thank you so much for honoring us tonight, Dr. Abdelghaffar Musa and Ustada Jumana. It's an honor to welcome you here, and we look forward to hopefully next time celebrating your return to Abbasiyah. Um, it's it's possible. It is possible, and that's why. Let me say one thing. Of I'm course. Wondering in my life, and this is about the uh, United Kingdom and the British people. I said this when I was in high school, believe it or not, I want to see in my life that England becomes a third world country. <laughs> but unfortunately, it became a second class nation. It did not achieve what I wanted England to be because all what we talk about started in England. Right. And they still yes. owe us the reparations. Yes. Do we have another question from Jadir. Um, so I know when I was a kid, I well, when I was younger, younger, younger. <laughs> when I was younger, um, I believe that um the Israelis, because I didn't know, I didn't know what they looked like. I thought they were like monsters with huge bazookas and stuff trying to blow up places. But um now, I know what they actually are now, but my question is, is, do you think this is a one-sided war or do you think it's not? So I will say two things about that. Um, you know, we've often had this conversation at home, right? It's not the Israelis writ large, right? They're just like any other country. They don't all support their government. They don't all believe the same thing. Just like everybody in this country doesn't believe the same thing. Um, you know, the question of monsters, honestly, when people get when people get very militarized and they're in all the equipment, they do look kind of monstrous, whether it's the police here in the United States or it's the occupying forces uh, in Palestine. And so it's not that far off when somebody is heavily armed and heavily guarded. And so the question of it, is it a one sided war? It's not a war. And that's actually what Jade was getting to with her paper. When you have 
one country that is a nation that has an established government that has a military that controls every aspect of life. And then you have a people who are subjected to every aspect of the whims of that other nation. That's not a war. And so they're an occupying force. And, and, and we could have, <laughs> if you really want to have a conversation about international law, they have obligations and duty as an occupying force that they don't meet. And in fact, they instead violate the laws of war all the time. But you cannot have a war between an occupier and an occupied people. That's not a war. It's an occupation. Thank you so much. I had the honor of meeting Jalil at the event that uh, yeah. Representative Tlaib organized uh, on Capitol Hill. And I asked him if he'd uh, make it to tonight's event. He said he needs to look in, at his schedule and see because, you know, he has. But I'm. <laughs> thank you so much for honoring us, Jalil. Uh, Jalil is the future. And this is, you know, this is I'm glad that we're ending with this note because the Palestinian cause is not just about lamenting the loss, but also it's about reclaiming what, what is precious. And what is precious is to be able to live in our country in dignity and honor. And that's it. This is the whole essence of why Palestinians are engaged in this struggle. And, uh, and hence the title of tonight's event, Remembering the Nakba, Preparing for Return. Thank you so much all for, for attending. Please join me in thanking Dr. Abdul Ghaffar, Musa, and Ustada Jumana. And again, thanks so much for honoring us here at the Palestine Center and the Jerusalem Fund. Uh, next week, we're, we have the annual uh, Hisham Sharabi Memorial Lecture. The flyers are on the chairs. Uh, we're hosting Professor Bassam Haddad, uh, who is going to uh, give this lecture this year. Please uh, join us if you can make it. It would be a great honor to have you again. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs>